So there was news. Uh, Jeff sent us news again. So thanks, Jeff. He always sends us news. Um, so SE6, we, we all need to know to stop using it. Because <laughs> the, last, the last free update comes out on February 19th. And if you want to keep using it after that, you can just write your checks, make them out to Mike. Yes, please. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> I'll give you my post office. Yes. Uh, so IntelliJ released IDEA 12 recently. Uh, it comes with the, uh, what we affectionately refer to on the Arai team as the cool haircut theme. Because developers with cool haircuts use the dark background and the, the fruity <laughs> syntax highlighting colors, um, which they call Darkula. It's a nice name. Um, yes. And for the, next, for the next 12 hours or so, no less, 11 hours, you can pick it up for 50 bucks. If their server's going, because <laughs> apparently earlier it was kind of not going. Um, so there's some Java updates. We kind of have a slide for this every month, so there's lots of Javas coming out. Um, so the headline features for Java 7 Update 10 are it's certified to work on OS 10.8 and Windows 8 in desktop mode. Um, and the browser plugin now warns people who are launching applets or JNLP files if they have an old Java. Um, and uh, Java 6 Update 38, which I guess is the penultimate release of Java 6, um, has a bunch of bug fixes and a new time zone file. Uh, GPAR has reached 1.0 after, I don't know, like five years in the making, maybe more been around for a long time. Uh, so it makes, uh, it has a bunch of parallel programming utilities for Groovy. Uh, probably the headline feature is that uh, you can just use a, like an annotation to make all of your collection manipulations uh, go in parallel instead of in series. So that's kind of neat, something that we're expecting in Java 8. And uh, they've added promises, which is like the cool new version of futures to GPARs. I don't actually know anything about promises. Can anyone here enlighten us? <laughs> All right, yes. <laughs> They're like features, but they can be broken, yeah. Okay, That's, we'll go with that. So uh, DevOps happened. It was happening uh, during our last meeting. So Jeff and I were missing because we were actually there. And Jeff took these pictures. Uh, so that's the, what became the trade show floor, although it looks like the, the booths weren't set up yet. So that was probably uh, during the good. university days. Yeah. Uh, this is at DevOx in Antwerp, Belgium. Oh, cool. Um, see the bags in that picture? I have one to give away tonight. Where is it? It's here. It looks just like the ones in the picture. So, uh, I don't know. Best question tonight. You, you win this bag. As, uh, as voted by the crowd. Um, that's what uh, the venue looks like. It's a movie theater. So it looks like that. It's good nobody's ever sitting in front of you because they have stadium style seating. Uh, there's the Java Posse. They've appointed a new member of uh, Chet Haas is now a member of the Java Posse. And he's got the giant hat to prove it. Um, so DevOx has been really widening its reach over the last few years. They expanded into France last year, the UK this year. And now instead of uh, geographic expansion, they're doing uh, age group expansion, and they're going into DevOps for kids, um, which I think the bottom end of their age range, do you remember, Mike, is it eight? Uh, it was young. It was grade, yeah, something like grade uh, five, maybe? Yeah, like somewhere around there. So great, sort of like grades five to low end high school type ages. Um, it looks really cool. They had a video that I probably can't show you because I don't have Wi-Fi access right now. But um, Adib, did you? Oh, OK. Sorry, I thought you wanted to add something. Um, yeah, so what we kind of wanted to do was take up uh, Stefan on his offer and uh, try doing a DevOps for Kids in Toronto. Uh, Mike is interested in doing the same in Ottawa. Um, so if we kind of pool our resources and coordinate on time, we could probably even get cool toys like these robots that uh, 
we have a video of, for example. Um, let me just find the video. So I don't know who's seen this already, but these guys opened the show at DevOx. It's from a company called Now Robotics, and we have some information about it. Because, let's see if we get sound here. What's that? Is there a Gangnam style there? Yeah. I, I imagine there is, but uh, for the low, low price of, what was it, 3,000 euro, uh, you can get one. And then, um, that's, a, that's a deep discount. They actually cost 12,000 euro each to make. Um, as long as you keep releasing apps for them, you can keep it. But uh, they're interested in getting kids interested in this too. Um, so we think maybe if we put on a DevOx for kids, they probably send us one to play with. Um, yes, so I'll ask again on the mailing list, but uh, is anyone interested in helping out with DevOps for Kids type thing? Adib, Andrew, Jeff, John, excellent. Okay, we have a quorum. <laughs> so we'll, uh, we'll figure this out. Um, excellent. So another thing that came up at DevOx was uh, there's this website. They actually won the Duke's Choice Award a couple years ago, Kiva. Um, uh, Matthias Carlson, who organizes the JFocus conference, um, has put together a, a Java team that's, that's doing quite well on here. It's a, the basic idea is a microloan site. Um, you can kind of see the sort of Google map of the income disparity here. So the green dots are people who have lent those women who run a grocery store in India some money. The red, the red uh, marker is where the grocery store actually is. And they've got a business plan. They, they have a, an operating business, and they need to be lent some money so that they can stock their shops so that they can actually sell things to the customers who come in. Um, and you can use this website to lend them money in any increment that you want. The loan is expected to be paid back unless their business fails. Um, and all the people with uh, green markers on the map have lent them some money to, to help fund their business. People on the Java team, there are 109 people. They've made 875 loans, cumulatively, about eight loans per member. And they've loaned, uh, in aggregate, almost $25,000 to people who are developing businesses all over the world. If you want to join and help out the stats uh, for people who are Java teams, you can go to this URL, kiva.org slash team slash jug. It's quite easy to sign up. I actually made my first loan today just to see if I could vouch for it. It's very easy. It takes about five minutes to sign up and choose a project to lend money to. I've and been on there for a few years. Yes. I've made like 50 loans. Yes. I've only had one loan go bad on me, and I lost like $2.50. Well, there you go. That's a ringing endorsement then. So it's, it's amazing. I, I can't highly... It's a great gift to... If you have someone you don't know what to get up for a Christmas gift, Yeah. send them a, a Kiva loan that they can lend out. Excellent. Yeah, because the person you give it to can then choose who to lend the money to. Exactly. Yeah. And you get it back. You can cash out, but I think most people usually just make another loan. But yeah. It's been the same $200 on there for like four years now. It's right. Really awesome. It's really cool. Yeah. So I think, yeah, this map kind of says it all. It's like there is, uh, there is income disparity, and, and we can do something about it in a constructive way. So, uh, Conference calendar. There's some conferences coming up. JFocus is coming up soon, first week in February. Uh, EclipseCon uh, offered us a $100 discount for any members who want to go. There's a discount code here. We'll be publishing these slides. Uh, DevOx has expanded into London. And the call for papers is open, so submit something. You get a free pass if your talk is accepted. Uh, Geekon in Poland is also looking for people to present. Uh, it's happening in May. 
And uh, they pointed out in the CFP announcement that there are over 100 amazing places to drink beer in Krakow. Uh, Matthias uh, Carlson offered to let us give away a pass to DevOx. And this not DevOx, JFocus, thank you. <laughs> so we present uh, JFocus the raffle. Uh, does anyone here think that they're free during that week? and could buy their own travel? My buddy lives in Stockholm. Well, there you go. <laughs> so. Well, going once? Twice? Yeah. Well, if you can commit to going, uh, you get a free pass to JFocus. Probably should do that. Yeah? OK, you don't have to answer right away, because yeah, there's nobody else it. who's. Uh, yeah, I need to check with the boss first. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, uh, just if you're interested, uh, post on the mailing list kind of by I don't know, the end of the weekend, and if there's more than one person, we'll come up with some randomized process for awarding it. I'll buy them a beer when they're there. <laughs> well, there you go. I'll be there as well. Mike is single-handedly responsible for the <laughs> JFocus conference. Uh, anything else before we move on to Mike's talk? Pressing Java News? No? OK. So we present Mike Keith. OK, so um, my name is Mike Keith. As I mentioned, I work on some of the Java EE specifications, uh, Mark at Oracle, and I, I also do some other things. Um, I wanted to know how many people here uh, work with Java EE specifically? OK, and the rest of you, do you know Java EE? Have you worked on it in the past? Sort of, a little bit? Because I. I um, spend a lot of my time with Java EE specs and uh, uh, one of the things that uh, I have to say to begin with is that uh, you can't hold me responsible for anything I say, <laughs> <laughs> which is really kind of nice. I want to have one of these for home too, but uh, my wife won't let me buy into that one. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about a configuration service and this is something that I've been kind of talking about for about a year internally and uh, now it's getting to the point where uh, I think I'd like to start a, a JSR on it, and so um, before I, I write up the JSR request and, and get this off, I want to make sure that we're solving the right problems. So I'm kind of embarking on uh, some external conversations with people. So I've spoken to some, some different companies now. I've talked to Jason at Red Hat. Uh, I've talked to some folks at IBM, and some other folks at other companies. And now I want to talk to the people who are doing the real work, and that's you guys. So. I'm going to go through some of the common problems that people have talked about with configuration in Java EE and let you know kind of what we think the problems are and then you can tell me if we're right. One of the things that, uh, um, I don't know if you know uh, Evgeny Kabanov, uh, JRevel, um, you know, he always complains about DevOps and how DevOps has these problems that Java EE doesn't solve. And one of the biggest problems that he complains about is this first one where you have a single application and you want to deploy it multiple times, perhaps in different environments. And so he complains a lot about this problem. And so I sat down with him at Java 1 uh, this, this, this past year and uh, you know, we hashed it out saying, okay, here's, here's how we think we can solve the problem. And he was quite happy at the end. So I don't know if you guys have the same problem as what he sees, um, but you're nodding your head. So at least, at least one of you does, two of you, a few of you. That's good, that's a good start. Uh, so one of the, the main problem for those others of you who don't have these problems are that, you know, as you deploy a Java E application, you want to tie it to certain resources, but you don't want to code those resources into the application. Otherwise, you'd have to rip the application apart and put those resource definitions back in again every time you redeploy it, which causes you to reversion the application and all the, the kind of consequences of that, which are ge generally bad. So this is the biggest problem, I think. First and foremost, what we have to solve is decoupling the resource definition from the application itself, allow you to sort of package it separately. Um, also, you know, and this is another thing Evgeny was complaining about, um, not having to deploy this through a manual deployment tool, right? DevOps have to do this each time. They like to script it to have some sort of way of doing this so you can deploy this. And most application servers have some uh, scripting deployment tool. Now, we're not necessarily going to standardize that part. But at least if you package the resources up, then it would be scriptable. Um, something that's been solved sort of partly in different parts of Java EE are profiles. 
Um, we know that uh, in JSF they have some profiles, kind of staging, they call them. Um, they have something in uh, CDI as well that, that allows you some kind of profile-like injection um, that allows you different alternatives. Um, so they have the alternative qualifier. We'd like to do this kind of at configuration and allow the resources to be deployed differently depending on what your environment is. And so you'd have a testing profile, you might have a deployment profile, a production profile rather. And so this was what configuration would solve as well. You could configure configuration resources based on a particular profile and then set that profile for your, for your application server. And then properties, right now environment properties are kind of difficult. I mean, they're like, three or four lines of XML in order to get an environment en uh, entry and then to configure these things and then to try to pull this out again like we talked about earlier to, to remove it from the application archive is the key. But so while we're doing this we'd also like to make that environment entry or these properties a lot more um, I guess easier to configure and manage. So it would that's kind of a goal as well. So there would be resources and properties. In addition to that, um, I think maybe these are kind of secondary, but still on my list of things. And that is um, people like to have configurations that are version. They'd like to kind of have some history of these configurations. Um, you know, we're not going to get into a versioning system and we're certainly not going to get into versioning like we're going to get into in module systems. This will come when we get Jigsaw into the picture. But nevertheless, uh, you do like to have some notion of um, something that you can put in in a version, uh, in a dependency rather, that refers to a specific version of that configuration. Um, there are different ways that people like to access configuration. Um, people will generally want injection to get configuration resources um, and properties, but you know, there, you might also be able to look it up dynamically using an API. So I think we'll probably do both of those in the end. One of the reasons why this first came up a year ago was we were doing some, so I also worked in the past, I was an architect for uh, a, a Toplink, which was a, um, a, a Java persistence solution. So um, I still work with those guys a fair bit and I work on the JPA spec as well. So, you know, and they're the reference implementation. So I still kind of help them out and mentor some of the people there and kind of coordinate some of that development effort. And one of the, the product managers who was doing some demos for the multi-tenancy stuff and uh, it turned out that he, he wanted to have, he had a SaaS application and he wanted to have some configuration for different tenants. And he had nowhere to put this, so we stored them in files and then, you know, had this really work, <laughs> it was a terrible workaround. He went and had this kind of web service go out and pull these files in for each tenant. And um, he, th he complained that there was no way to store this configuration information on a per tenant basis for a SaaS application. So you couldn't dynamically say, add a tenant, store this configuration for that tenant and let me go get it as I get a tenant request. So this is kind of what got me started on this configuration service. And also um, I work with OSGI a fair bit and um, OSGI has, has actually a config service, a config admin service. How many people here have used OSGI? Okay, so OSGI uh, is a very dynamic environment. And so the idea in OSGI is that you can have things coming and going regularly and this configuration admin service can itself becoming and going regularly. But if there's a config admin service, uh, then you could ask it for certain configurations and someone could add a configuration at any time or remove it at any time and you could query for that configuration. So this is kind of perfect um, for a multi-tenant situation because you have tenants coming and going. Someone can sign up a tenant, add some information for that tenant and um, lo and behold when the application is tenant aware, it can ask for a tenant that it gives a tenant ID for and get the configuration for that tenant and without having to, you know, um, bounce the server or bounce the application. So, and, 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 you know, finally, again, OSGI allows you this notification, which, you know, is kind of useful sometimes. You can sign up for a listener or some notifier that says, oh, if this configuration changes, then let me know and, um, and then I can react accordingly and, you know, you may or may not want to do something with that. So these are kind of things on the roadmap, I think, for a configuration. Question. Yes. So, uh, so you said for the multi-tenant application, would that configuration be configuration that would impact the container that the application is running in? Or is that more like, oh, you're supposed to use this prefix, or this is the part of the database that's yours, 
Is it application specific configuration information or container? Um, well, I, I it's more application specific. It's it's typically resources that the application is going to use. So we're talking about a SaaS application. So it's going to be operating on multiple resources. One perhaps one login or one resource for each tenant. So think of a tenant as a user where um, uh, I, I have a, an, uh, a CRM system. Okay, let's take that as the the, the typical uh, SaaS application. So I have um, some company logging in and they log in under their user ID and they access their database. And then I have another company logging into my CRM and then they want to access their database. So as a SaaS application, I, if I'm accessing um, the resources for one tenant, I don't want to be able to let them see the resources for the other tenant. I want to isolate them within so that application. Your, your JDBC so connection details would be... All that would be separate, yeah. Separate. Yeah, yeah. So these are the kind of resource, resources we're talking about. They're container supplied, but they're application specific. That makes sense. Okay. So they would fall under certain container profiles of, of types so, of resources. So presumably using that, I could say, I'm going to have a test configuration, which even though it's running on my production server, is going to actually send the request to the test database. So I could, in theory, test, like go on the production server, do some things I wouldn't normally do with the application. Yeah, so if you go to the, the profiling use case that we talked about earlier, where I could say this is going to be a test configuration, um, the, sort of the, this is a profile for testing, so I could actually, you know, if I was able to start or deploy that application <coughs> and give that profile, a testing profile, then it would go and pull out the testing configuration and use that to supply the configuration information for that application. Right. Any other, any other questions about anything we've said so far? Okay. Well, I'll, well, we'll talk some more about it afterwards. I'm going to kind of hurry through some of this material to begin with, and then, then we can dig down as much as you want. So the solution is that we have something like a configuration service. Um, I call it a configuration service. You kind of think of it as a configuration, like a little container inside of the Java E container. It's a support for configuration within the container. Um, whether it be um, it'll be some kind of archive, whether it'll be a jar archive or a, a car configuration archive, I don't know. We'll, we'll have something. Probably will be a jar, probably not a special new kind of archive, but I don't know yet. Uh, the JSR will figure this out and we'll get there. But the idea is that it'll, it'll be created separately, have a different life cycle from the application itself. And I can deploy it. Now you might expect that I would deploy this before the application because the application is going to have dependency on this configuration. So if I tried to deploy the application without the configuration, the, con the application deployment should fail, for example. So the container would integrate these configurations with other types of services that exist in the container. Okay? And there might be some CDI integration, for example. There might be other types of integration with other types of containers within the, the application server. And as I said, the application has to state that it depends on a certain configuration for it to run. That configuration might be filled in later, uh, separately, uh, in a configuration archive. And I might have one or more of these things. We'd like to both have injection, um, as well as the API, so that you can inject these configuration resources or properties into your application. Or you might dynamically go out and call an API to get them, if you want to. Okay. So let's go through a, a quick example of, let's say I'm just running a, an application archive and, and you might, might have any one of these. You might have a full application archive or it might be just a, deploying a, an EJB jar as an application or it might be a, a web archive. So you're putting a couple of things in there. Let's say that it's an ear and we're going to use an application XML. You might have something like this. So this is kind of an example of what you know, I envision we might, we might end up with or we're going to start with. You'd require some configuration and you name it. I'm expecting to have a global.ds. Okay, I mean, it's a named configuration that's going to, um, what I'm expecting it to have is some data source in there. And so I'm stating my dependency from this application on that configuration. I might have some bean in there. It would, you know, some managed bean of some kind. And so I'm going to inject into that a data source. And I'm going to specify exactly which data source, the one in this global.ds configuration. Okay, so there's nothing really that special about this, except that 
we're externalizing the configuration. It's something that we're kind of importing, if you like, as a configuration resource. And I'm specifying which configuration I really want. And you can also see that it might be used inside of a uh, you know, persistence XML for people. How many people here use JPA? Good, good, happy to see it. <laughs> uh, so there is a, an element GTA data source where you actually specify a Jindy name for a data source. And this would be the Jindy name that is exported by the data source from this configuration. Okay, so this, would, this, should, be, this should be easy to do, it should be easy to use, and, and it should kind of fit together nicely when the configuration gets deployed. So what about the configuration itself? Well, I'm going to have some jar or car or whatever it is, and I might have something like an XML file, configuration XML. I would name my configuration, and I would configure my data source in here. So this is the XML snippet of stuff that you can put in an, XML, an application XML file right now. If you took that and said, okay, I want to put this in a configuration file, it would be defining a data source for me. So this is just defining a regular data source. I'm exporting it in this Jindy name, and uh, that would be available to me in my persistence XML for my application. Or, alternatively, I might actually want to, if I like annotations instead, I might want to use the annotation that we can use in Java E using data source definition. And then define the, the Jindy name that it goes in and the class and all that same sort of stuff. Right? This, why, why not? So different, different ways of, of defining the resources. I mean, the class doesn't really have anything, any purpose other than a place to define your, your resource on. So I, I mean, th this is kind of open right now as to how we're going to do it. This is just some sort of some suggestions for some of the ways that I'm thinking that would be possible and um, will be determined. So what happens then when you want to put this inside the container? So we're coming to the end here where we have an application on one side and we have our configuration archive there. We deploy our configuration archive and the configuration service then goes and reads the archive and loads all this information about the configuration in and now knows about all that configuration information. So now that we deploy our application, it, as it gets deployed, it sees and, and realizes that yes, I have this configuration available, deployment succeeds, and we can now go and inject any of those configurations into the application through the application, through the configuration service. We might also have the application call out to the configuration service and ask for certain configurations. So again, this, this multi-tenancy case, where we say, okay, given this tenant, give me the configuration for this tenant. We might, in fact, use a CDI to do the injection. So CDI may go, get, may, and go, may go and get the configuration, and then go and inject into the application as well. So there could be integrations with, as I mentioned earlier, some of the other services within the, within the container. So um, this kind of gives you an idea of the configuration service as a Java EE service and, and how it would play with the other services. So I wanted to know, are these, first of all, are these the kinds of things that, that do you guys have these problems? <laughs> these are the kinds of things you guys see, and, I, and I've seen some people already see that, so that's good. Um, would you see that this solution would meet your need? Is this something that would, would help you fix that problem with the ones, if that's how you see it, is this how you'd envision it to be fixed or would you see some other solution to that problem that might, might be better? I have a question. Yeah. Uh, what, what if the car had static resources in it, just like web resources, just in it, and they could overshadow the ones that were in the war over here? Right, uh, right, right there. yeah. Because that's, that's a problem that, yeah. I make frameworks now, so I don't have to worry about real world, but <laughs> but um, when, when we were doing real-world applications, we had this problem where we would make one generic application, yeah. and then every customer who bought it got a slightly different one, and we had to deal with that at build time and give them all their own wars. It would be kind of cool if there was one released war, and they had their car beside it that would override. The exactly. Yeah. yeah, no, that's exactly, uh, exactly a use case that we've talked about as well. Is you, you, it's, it's kind of the equivalent of having some annotation but overriding an XML. Well, you have yeah. something in the application, but it's overridden by the configuration. S the exactly. simplest example would be their company which appears in all of the right. applications. But even if classes, 
They're like the company logo. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody wants yeah. Yeah. graphics. Everyone's, yeah, so you have a generic application, but they can get overridden in certain configuration yeah. resources. Yeah. Just overshadow the style sheet. Yeah. 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 And that actually was uh, something that this, uh, this PM ran into. He was running this uh, multi-tenant sports app, and he was having these different kind of deployed application for multiple pro um, sports leagues, and they each wanted to have their own logo, and so he did that. He overrode the logo using this configuration, and it was exactly that case. So yes, that's a very good point, that you, uh, you, you typically want to come out with some default resources and then have them overridden for exactly. deployment. Yeah. I think yep. you really want to have it like, at the static resource level. Yeah, but maybe even a class file. That would be cool, but what if you have injection? Uh, Enable, enablement of alternatives. And stuff. Can, you, can you speak up? Okay, sorry. Yeah, I think like my only gripe, like my only question was whether this should be uh, like limited to static resources, or whether like what's the feasibility of actually having code as well? Right. That's, that's yeah. kind of one of the... Uh, so code, code is not something I was thinking of, and not right. something I would recommend actually in terms of class files. Right. Um, it's not really meant to be uh, application overriding d um, business code or application code logic of the application as much as it is resources. But Java's really good at like, finding stuff like that. Yeah, I, mean, you I don't know if I would want to, but from like a container point of view, it's not hard to be complicated. Right, if, if right. It, it, my, my point was yeah. that it'd be complicated in dealing with things like alternatives. Like doing stuff like CDI, which actually requires to know everything that you need. Yeah, it knows up front. You still, you still yeah. know up front. Yeah, you can define it. Yeah. You don't have multiple instances of the application. You have one instance of the application. It's possible to do this because, because you are, by the time you deploy this, you, you do have the configuration. In fact, that's a dependency. So it's a prerequisite of the application. So it is possible. I'm just not sure I would recommend it or that I'd want it to kind of necessarily go in that direction uh, because it's kind of... Uh, Tweaking what configuration really is now. Now it's saying I'm overriding the application. But doesn't that kind of generalize the idea of like annotation-based configuration in a class, like an empty class? It's just yeah, a more yeah. general example of what you've already suggested. Yeah, it, yeah, it is. It is. It's. I think um, what how you see the deployment, whether you see having one application, which actually like one application running, which switches between different in, like resources yeah, and multiple or multiple applications which run side by side, which happen to be the same. Now that you mention it, I just thought of a really good use case for that, and that is patches. You want to actually have an application and, uh, and you want to send out a patch for that application. Yeah. Um, you send it out as a configuration archive. Yeah. Seems like the wrong name for it, but... <laughs> that would be a different nightmare to you. Could be. You'd have to apply multiple patches and uh, multiple configurations, which uh, again, you know, I've, I've already planned to support multiple configurations per application. You could depend on, you know, any number of configurations, but it, it'd be static in the application. You would have written an application to say, I require these configurations. I think it's useful, it's just that you have to have a model where you run actually multiple instances of application, like of an application as opposed to having one instance which switches like multiple instances. Mm -hmm. well, you can do that too. It could even be memory efficient because the car could be its own class loader that gives preference to the things that are in the car and then that differs to the work. Yep. Well, yeah, I mean, to this is totally possible. I mean, yeah. there's nothing, I don't see anything in the container that would stop this from that. That's all right. There's a couple of so comments. One of the problems that we have had is, uh, especially since we've been investing in the JPOS 7 uh, configuration paradigm where everything is stored in the monolithic uh, configuration file, uh, is it makes it very difficult for our ops team to figure out what's changed for this one application because you know there might be 10 other applications all stored in that same file, and they're trying to figure out. You know, the dev team is saying, this is the only thing that should have changed, and the dev team doesn't have all the other 10 applications here. So you're trying to do this differential between what the server has and what the dev team is saying, this is what it should have. And it's kind of a nightmare, really. Um, so, you know, I almost wonder, you know, if you start storing this stuff into jar files, the ops team has no way of looking at it saying, is this IP address the right IP address that should be talking to our server because we moved it last week? There's, there's no way for them to see, in, like, without unzipping it and checking it. Like, it, it, it changes the deploy time from, like, shut down the server, drop this file in, we've already done the diff beforehand, 
you know, restart the server and, you know, your deploy time switches from two minutes down to, like, you know, I don't know how long it would take them to actually clean this up. This, well, is, this is some of the problems that we've been seeing with, uh, I see. with the, the monolithic configuration file. Everyone's getting everything in. This is one step away from that where you've got your own separate car files, but I think it's still, you know, there's still some complexity in the ops team actually being able to inspect the configuration saying, no, in this environment, this one thing has to change. It's not this, exactly the same as what the dev team is saying. And I think that's one area where I'd be concerned. Well, so that, that, was, that was what we were trying to specifically solve, was the dev ops guys coming and saying, this configuration archive represents the environment for this deployment. And so they look at that exact car file and say, okay, this, this, is, this is all the settings. I, you know, it may be overriding some global things um, and because some servers have some global configuration that they do, you know, in, in this, for example, in, this, in, the, in the JBoss case. But I think this, is a, this applies to most application servers where they have some global configuration options as well that you override. But I, I don't know where else, I mean, apart from bundling it into one place, I don't know how else, what, 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 what story could be better than that? It's more like the visibility, like, you know, the old, I mean, from our experience, the old JBoss way of doing things where you dropped in XML files, at least the, dev, the ops team can basically compare the two XML files and say, oh. this, is, this is version, you know, 1.0. Oh, yeah, yeah. Maybe version 2.0. Right. Yeah, this file, this actually has to be this IP address. And it makes it very easy to compare and prepare for the actual deployment. Whereas, you know, when you start providing jar files, they, like they have no insight. Like they have to unzip it, they have to figure out well, what's in there, is that right? I should mention that part of, um, I showed you something that I, I hoped would kind of highlight the configuration parts, and I showed you a configuration XML file. But what I also envision is, so I just banged the microphone, I don't know if it. <laughs> may ruin everything. But the, the, the one thing that I also envision is having a sort of similar set of files. Like you could deploy an application XML file in your configuration archive, which will define all the resources that you're missing or that you are specifically applying to this application. And um, similar to, you know, you might have some of the other archive files that typically go along some of the metadata that goes along with your application. And so you could do a diff on your jar with the application and, and come up with the differences at deployment from what's what the developer thought it was. Um, but I didn't show all of those because I thought, well, people will think, well, you know, it's just the same old things, but just stuffed in a different archive. I wanted to kind of show that you could also just have this separate configuration. And because we also had people ask for a single file, they wanted to merge a lot of the metadata from all the other files that are scattered around and put them in one file. So, I mean, yeah. I, I mean, I, yeah. It's interesting because if it's application specific and it's one configuration file, it does make it very easy. Like you can compare them side by side. Yeah. But that, but, <laughs> but this file wouldn't doesn't exist in Java E, right? And we wouldn't plan on adding this to Java E. This would only be for configuration. So then you wouldn't be able to diff. But it would show you kind of one file. It'd be easy to specify stuff in there, but you wouldn't be able to kind of see. You'd have to take. Oh, this would have belonged in Web XML, and this part would have been in the application. And so <laughs> there's kind of both sides of that. And I, I understand what you're saying. Um, is, there, is there anything that you would, you would suggest over and above having an, ar an archive file that kind of encapsulate all this configuration information? Because I couldn't think of. Well, I think the, the good thing about this approach is that you can, it's just like any other um, Java artifact where you know, using Maven or what have you, you can convert it. Right, right, right. It's version control, exactly. You exactly know this is version 1.1.1, .1 .1 and, and that's assuming you're following best software practices, that, that's not going to change. You know? Yeah, and you know that kind of falls into the versioning part that I was talking about, the configuration. I mean, there, there, there wouldn't be an integration at this stage of the version of the, but that would be kind of a workaround. You basically use the version control system as your versioning mechanism for your configuration. And that gets you sort of to that place before we actually integrate um, module systems and such. Oh, sorry, there's a question over here first. Uh, I wanted to ask about the small dependent example. Um, the way you're talking about it, I understand the use case. We have the use case of sort of archiving once and being able to deploy with different configurations. But I'm not sure how you get from that to the example where sort of a new a new CRM client signs up and without deploying the application again, somebody to add sort of tenant aware configuration. Right. So how I, it's it's a completely different use case. So don't don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that you can kind of evolve into that from the one. Um, it's a separate use case altogether. The use case is you're sitting in a cloud environment, for example. 
and this application has been deployed. I understand. I understand I, you understand the, the tenancy. Solution. Okay. Okay. I, I actually would like the uh, the solution for it, but oh, I just, I just didn't understand in the way you explained the. Yeah, the solution is that you you write your application so it is SaaS enabled, and it knows about configuration service, and so it knows that um, when you get a request from a given tenant, you take some tenant ID. And it knows by the time I get the request, there better be some configuration in the configuration service so for this tenant. You would, you would, sorry to cut you off, but you would, you would, you would change your configuration uh, dynamically to add the new tenant and then dump it on the server. Um, so, so these you would deploy a second configuration archive, for example, or you could modify an existing one. You just have to add a configuration in the configuration service. Okay, so, so you could deploy any number of archives. Specifically for a sort of a multi tenant scenario. Right, right, yeah. You'd, you'd deploy something with a tenant ID as part of that configuration, so it would be indexable. And you, you know, you use your tenant ID to look up that configuration. And just as a follow up, since you seem to be involved in the JSRs and things like that, what's the exact uh, status of multi tenancy in the um, Well, <laughs> we, the, the status is that uh, we deferred it from Java E7, as you probably know. And uh, we'll look at it again in Java E8. <laughs> That's pretty much it. Um, you know, uh, we looked at a lot of the multi-tenancy issues, and 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 a lot of the vendors said, you know, we're not ready for this yet, and uh, we don't want to define this at this point because things are still in flux too much. So we pulled back. <coughs> there really isn't much more to it than that, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> um, well, time will tell. Uh, as time goes on, uh, hopefully by E8, then people will be more ready for it. Maybe the market will have kind of stabilized a little bit, but. Uh, even now, I'm, I think it's still in flux, to be honest. And I'm not even sure we'll get to an E8, given where things are now. Because I, I just don't see things kind of coming out and saying, this is the way things should work. You know, we want to get away from doing things that we did back when, when we kind of started to try to create a model. We'd like to kind of say, well, here's what people are doing. Let's standardize the model that, that people like to use. Because um, if you try to standardize a, a brand new model that no one's tried before, and it turns out, you know, you might get it wrong. <laughs> and people that tried to use, you know, EJB 1.0 or 1.1 or even 2.0, you know, are all still re trying to recover. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, nobody there's a lot of JBoss people, so maybe I shouldn't say the word JBoss, but there's a lot of JBoss people, so maybe I shouldn't say the word spring framework, but it sounds like this is... Let's build a standard around all the similar you know, ideas around not just the Spring Framework, but there's you know, like called Hive or something that Apache had, and there's Pico Framework, all these dependency injection ones. Uh, but for us, when, in my industry, all these kind of things, we've had uh, credit adjudication, so we've, credit lending, we, we've, we've loaded up dynamically different, completely different rule sets which are implemented in completely different classes. So all right. their interfaces, just like different JDBC drivers. Yeah. Uh, and all that's configured in Spring, and it all runs multi-tenancy, basically serving all kinds of different customers with different credit lending rules all in one runtime. Um, and it just switches based on your customer, like, right. customer profile. Yep. So similar idea. Yeah, yeah, except that this would be dynamic. Yeah. Whereas with Spring, I don't think you can dynamically add things to Spring Config. You have, to, you have to restart. You have to, right, exactly. You have to restart. So we would, you wouldn't have to restart in this. You just could just deploy another configuration archive into this container, and then any applications could pick that up dynamically if they, if they got a request. So I think that's the beauty of the container is that there's this deployment mechanism that is kind of asynchronous. Yeah. I think one critical, one critical feature that would be really important for that is to have the ability to deploy code in this archive that can test that the configuration is correct. Because huh. a lot of the time, if you have something not working, where's the problem? Is the database down? Is the network to the database down? And so if I have a bunch of configuration in there, it would be great if there was a class that would implement a verified interface of some kind, and you could hit the admin console for the app server and say, run the verification code that's part of this configuration. And that could return, yes, it's all good, or no, it's not good. And that would be tremendous for DevOps trying to troubleshoot something. Hmm. Well, to be honest, that sounds like a, a, a sort of an additional tool where you, you, you know, right now when you deploy these resources or an application that includes the resource definitions, um, the application will check to make sure the resources are seen. And so the, there might be some 
um, some connections open, for example, on a database or whatever, just to make sure that the URL is valid. The difference between what the app server gives you with test connection, which yeah. you can do, is I might need to know, for example, that my database, my internal database version, yeah. or my schema is version 5. Right. And I might need to know that a certain some state of something is at, at the right level, which the app server would never be able to know. Exactly. Specific to my app. Right. So this is the kind of testing that I'm looking at, because it just makes the application that much more robust if it refuses to start with a configuration that is not correct, or when the configuration, something that the app depends on is bad, goes down, should be able to. Yeah, but that, that's what I mean, is that that's why those kinds of things, the server could do so much, and I think it would do the same that it would it would do the same for configuration information that it already does when you def define these resources in your application. It would do some sort of sanity checking that things are kind of at least sane in terms of configuration, you know, syntax and, 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 and parameters and things like that. But I think anything above that, anything specifically, anything that's application specific or domain specific is going to have to be a third party tool that would go ahead and, and check these resources and verify that they're in the state that you as the DevOps guy expect them to be. Because I don't think the what, configuration the service problem, could ever know that. The problem with that approach is, where, how do you get that third-party tool? How does that, that third-party tool integrate itself into the application server? Well, it's just an application. right? You just write an application that uses those resources and it runs. But there's all sorts of monitoring infrastructure in place already that you could rely on if there was a very simple verify yes or no. Like I know I've had to build this infrastructure for my application, yeah. and I'd be happy to share it with you and show you the details, because this is really something I've really struggled with, and I probably spent a lot of time, way more than I should have, actually writing code for solving these kinds of problems in my existing app. Yeah, I was going to say, maybe, maybe some kind of hook. No, no, I want to be able to call it on demand. I want a self-troubleshooting system. Things have been working fine. It stopped working. Why? Okay. I need to find out the layer where the problem is. So if I could, I could test things from the point of view of the application's configuration, I could check mark that's good. OK, now I can go with someone else. You want to test from the inside out. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I want to, from what's in the app server, what's, what's the application seeing? So why wouldn't, why wouldn't a third, a, an additional application that you deploy for that specific purpose as essentially a configuration monitor, if you like? Be, because here's why. Because I, I, if I was deploying two applications, maybe uh, I deployed application A, but I fat fingered it, and application B, I had the old version of the verification code. And if I'm deploying on a cloud, and I don't really know wh how, where it's going to end up on the cloud, maybe one application will end up on one server, and the other application will end up on another server, and it happens that the network router between those two broke down. So I would really like it to be like really part of it so that there'd be no opportunity for them to ever diverge. OK, well, I'll have to talk to you about it later. Sure, I'll have to talk to you in detail about it. For some of that quarter, I think we've, we've just thrown JSPs at it. Like, so <laughs> did JSP, throw in some custom code. Yeah, for what you're as an application, problems, yeah. Then you can, then yes, you that's yeah. the way that I see it as well. Yeah. Yeah, so um, an app that I'm actually currently migrating to in Java, at least Java that um, it has a lot of flat files that can be considered. Like, I'm sort of running the same problem. So you're gonna, like, basically, you need to pass in a brand or two directory that contains a bunch of files that can be, that can be modified on the fly. So I, I really like the solution because I don't like the fact that people can go in and fuck with configuration. I'd rather have a version like this. Um, to Jonathan's talk about resources, how do you sort of see the API in order to get like a, a, a resource, um, how do you see that working? Um, so the, there would be a Java API, first of all, that would allow you access to, you know, through the configuration service, say, get me the resource named something. Yeah. And that would return back the resource that it finds and the configuration for that type. Um, it, it might be typed, you know, you could say uh, the resource should be of this type and, and then you get a, you know, class cast exception or something like that if it wasn't of that type or these yeah. kinds of things. And dynamic employees, but, is it like that's something that yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So it would also potentially be in, in Jindy, so that as these, I mean, for old style ops or whatever, uh, some people like to use Jindy to get things dynamically. So uh, you could also imagine that these configuration resources would get put in Jindy when they get deployed. Depending on the visibility, they could be visible to um, everybody in the application server, or they could have some a target for a given application. 
saying these resources, this configuration is for this application and this application only. So other applications wouldn't be able to see that configuration when they went and looked it up. And um, you would look at something like the latest Java E in terms of like uh, standardized naming for this so we would run the same problems we had uh, uh, back when, you know, WebLogic was stored here and JBoss was stored here. Yeah, in fact, I, I think for configuration naming, so in, for Jindy naming, yeah, we'd all use the, the current Jindy stuff, which is scoped by global application, those kinds of things. Um, but I think configuration naming would just be a simple namespace. It would just be simple, you know, sort of strings. Uh, you, might have, you might have the case where you would have global configuration and you'd have assets. Yeah, yeah, I think so, definitely. You'd have properties and you could set, you know, my my language to be something and then all the applications run on this language or whatever and you could have you know some currency or whatever set for for that so an application would pull the global currency property out and say use this and all the applications would use that i could see lots of cases for environment entries and people use environment entries now they're just not very nice to use and they're you know they're not global really properly so they set them for all their applications so is this going to run outside the container so that your unit tests can find the configurations yeah, so, uh, so one of the things I have on the roadmap uh, is that it'd be uh, uh, pluggable and standalone. So you could uh, also be able to have kind of a standalone configuration service that you could run that would you know, kind of persist itself in memory um, and uh, uh, be able to respond to requests just from the Java VM. Um, so it would be easy to test, yeah. Any other comments? Well, let me see if there's any other questions I wanted to ask. Oh, dynamics. Was that, was that something that, that kind of resonated with anybody else here, the dynamic configure it did with you? you mean like, what do you mean by dynamic? Well, I mean that, um, so sometimes people want to know, they're, they're running this application, they want to know, for example, um, a configuration for something that they didn't care, that isn't statically defined, that they get to some point in code and say, now I want another configuration. And they go on and go and ask for it. Um, so I wondered if this was something realistic. I mean, you don't see this a lot in Java EE code because first of all, it's not possible. <laughs> but but uh, secondly, I, I wasn't really sure if this was something we should spend a lot of time on because I, I mean, I, I work in OSGI a lot and everything's dynamic, so I, I see that. But, look at uh, transaction time right? Yeah. Normally you're going along, let's say you run your application for a year straight. Five minutes, all, all transactions, no problem. But then you all of a sudden you run into this one situation where this one client, whatever complex query you're trying to run, takes six minutes. And you just need like just to get you through to the next version until you actually deploy the next version. I just need to be able to configure it so that six minutes without actually having to rebuild my application, reconfigure all the okay. It would be nice to be able to go in and just say, you know, for this, for this same session being made for the default six minutes. And you'd like to do that without bringing your application down? Without bringing the application down. Okay. I mean, that would, that would be one case where... So the application would have to be written to be dynamic and say, I'm always going to look for the timeout whenever I... Yeah, okay. But, it, I mean, that's just not a capability that you have. Yeah, it's not, it's not possible right now. Yeah. I'll give you, I'll give yeah. you another use case where this is very useful. Uh, so being in a startup, we're always building all these features. And it would absolutely be horrible to keep like 15 different branches for all of them. So in my application, I can just ask it, are you in production or are you in development? And if it's in a bunch of places, be like, okay, don't put this stuff up on the UI. If you're running in production, when you're in development, show it to me on my local machine. Yeah. So that's that's the kind of thing that would be nice to be able to. Profiles, yeah. To just flip it between the two. Because you just happen to have some customer in front of you that goes, oh, uh, it would be really cool to see that feature. And you're like, oh, I'd have to set up my development environment for you. So if you could flip a some switch somewhere and have it show up, would be cool. Okay, but uh, so so the profiles, at least the way I pictured them so far, is they wouldn't be dynamic; they'd be st static. You, when you deployed the application, you deployed to a given profile with a given profile as kind of dynamically saying, "Deploy this as part of the deployment yeah, tool." But, but in, in this, what I'm talking about is the code is already on that, right? So, so there isn't like a separate code branches in the source repo. No, it's, no, it's there's the a, same branch. It's yeah, just, there's yeah. an if statement somewhere that says, "Don't show this menu item." Unless you're in production. All oh, right, so you'd have a persistent property or something like that for that. Yeah. But, it's but again, that property wouldn't be. Oh, okay. So you'd I like to set that property while the application's running? Yes. Okay. If so I'd then, be able to yeah. Just basically say, boom, let's just change. Okay. That. And I mean, I, I really see like the value of this if somehow 
all of the configuration in there could be displayed on the administration console for the application server. Yeah. And then you could go in there with the standard one at administration console and tweak them for whatever reason. That would what be really something cool. Something like yeah. all of the deployment descriptors, like all the properties that are set in there, uh, being exposed as mbeams that you can update. Exactly. For example. Yeah. yeah. And, and add new ones. So you could add even new configuration properties that weren't there at deployment time. Yep. Yep. Yeah, I mean, I again, I see lots of use cases, but I, I see most people using you know, OSGI and other things for dynamics, and uh, I don't see them as much in Java EE. So, yeah, I was interested I to know if I was limited. You, said you, can't. you can't. Yeah, you can't do it. So maybe that's why. <laughs> I remember many years ago when I made my first servlet, I just assumed that all the stuff in the web.xml was going to be mutable through some sort of API. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't until much longer you could even create a servlet, you know, programmatically. Yeah. You know, very recently. <laughs> so, yeah. That's true. Uh, was there any other questions I had? Oh, yeah, tools. What kind of so uh, I would argue that's a tool, but uh, but maybe not. I mean, I don't know. You'll have to talk to me more about that. So, one one other use case is like what if your application is modular, right? Like I've got feature A, feature B, feature C, and I want to keep the configurations for feature A, B, and C separate from each other. Is that some sort of concept that, that you're thinking about whereby you could say okay. here's the configuration for the, all these modules together? Yeah, I think the module in Java E is application right now uh, in terms of isolation. So I think that would probably be the limit that we would, uh, that we would scope things at. You have something visible. I, I think I think of it as visibility. So I would say something would be visible to an application or to many applications, or some subset of applications. Within an individual application. So for example, I have my application yeah, that's two what I say. giant features, right. and I have two different development teams working on them, and you know, and being able to say, you guys keep your configuration here, you guys keep your configuration here. Let's not worry about. Collisions and, com and conflicts and yeah, and, and but being able to combine those. I well, so, so all, all I'm saying is that in terms of isolation, in terms of you know what they could see if they wanted to, um, I don't think that we would get any more finely grained than an application. There's nothing stopping you from having multi, you know, a configuration per feature. Um, but if one feature wanted to go and look inside the configuration of another feature in the same application, they could. I mean, but it'd be easy, you know, to say, okay, I, I'm going to I'm going to group things by feature. So we would support that, but I don't think we would enforce it. Yeah. I think that. What do you think about for tooling support? Like, what would have you come up with? Well, I was thinking about something you know similar to to um, to what was being discussed in terms of uh, verification, but it was along the lines of um, you know generation of these things. Uh, how easy it would be to generate a configuration archive, um, and and I think a lot of that would probably end up becoming an IDE job. Um, but also being able to kind of scrape a configuration from an archive, uh, an application, for example, and say, okay, give me everything that's there. Give me a tool that will kind of take the configuration out and then let me kind of uh, change the things that I want to in there. These kinds of things. Um, the kinds of. Sorry, how would the application expose what it's interested in? It would have to be a tool that understood the format of applications and go and pull the metadata out of all the application. So it would, it would look at everything from annotations to XML files. It would rifle through the thing, dig around in there and see everything that's offered, then pull it out and extract configuration type stuff and say, here's what you're looking at with this application. What do you want to change? I, I, I mean, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not in DevOps, so I, I don't know. If, that sounds to me like that'd be useful if I was, because then I could say, here's what I want to change. Um, chick, 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 change that, and then create a configuration archive from that and go. But I don't know. Like you don't want to be walking through a web UI or anything like that. And like, yeah, they want to start, they want to like drop it and yeah. restart the server. Like that's it. But what what do they want to drop? They have to create some configuration, no, right? No, I know. I'm just this is what I'm saying. This is the thing I'm talking about is how they create the configuration. Oh, but to me, I think it's always the developer that's going to have to provide that to DevOps. Like the developer is going to say, these are the things you configured. This is the values that you're looking yeah. for. Um, and for me, it's like it, it's something that I would have my development. If, I, if I'm exposing this, I would have a dev. I mean, I just you let them create the archive and say give it to them, and then and then they would change it. It's almost like a, a difference engine too, like yeah. saying here's a difference to apply. Maybe that's mm -hmm. part of it too. 
But I mean, you gotta know what to, di what to differ. Like the DevOps guy has to know what, what are the sorts of things that I have to change or that I should change or I don't know, maybe, maybe they already know. Well, some of the stuff that, for example, if you're having a game execute, developer knows that. They're like, I, I wrote some code that depends on this new JMSQ. This is a, this, I'm adding this JMSQ. Yeah, so the DevOps guy has, needs to know that, right? Things that the developer doesn't know are the IP address and potentially the production database server. They, they probably don't know that. But they know they rely on a database. They know they rely so they, on they spit that out. I mean, like, I'm just saying, like, there's some yeah. things that the developer knows really well. Right. And there are other things that they don't actually know. Yeah. And that's, yeah, that's where so I that's why it seems to me like if you had something that scraped through the application and said, here's all the resources that I use. Um, now you can kind of customize these according to the operating environment. Uh, I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe, maybe yeah. uh, uh, another way to look at it is to think of it as a, a sequence of refactorings to your configuration from the initial state, and you would just write, write some sort of command that says, change this to this, and it just runs through them from the beginning to the end, and yeah. that's that your state. Specified even though, because if, like, if the developers give ops or DevOps a uh, new configuration, Ops should be perfectly capable of dipping it against the last configuration they got from the same developers. But I think it's a lot more difficult to dip it. To dip it. You're dipping a effectively uh, zip on the car. Sure, if you want right? them to That's where, where right now, a lot of the stuff that we do is yeah. it's like we say, here's a, an INI file or a properties file, and then you just you change the values here for whatever particular environment. So that right. uh, that yeah, might be a bit of a yeah. I think it does. Sort of say, if there was an option to like say variable substitution in the car and, and have some sort of standardized property file which you can just do um, variable substitution there. I don't know if that would be that. Yeah. Yeah, variable substitution is something that someone brought up, but it's not something I think I want to get into. I don't want to create a whole new kind of language. <laughs> so then, then if you run into the problem, where do you put the file that has the variables, right? Yeah. 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 That's what I'm saying. Just just specified. adds another layer of interaction. It wants a tool for yeah, that. If there, was, if there was a really nice car editor and compare it to yeah. all, then, yeah. Yeah, yeah. then you'd be good, right? Yeah. Load in two cars, show the difference. Yes. Because once you yeah. your sort of business rules kind of car stuff from your technical, this is the IP address yeah. stuff. Okay. And you have different cars for those things. So then your deployment focuses just on the technical stuff. Mm -hmm. And once what is a car is specified, then somebody can make it. The problem is now you can't make it to one. Yeah. 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 I just see yeah. making like emergency changes is going to be a lot more difficult for DevOps guys to deploy and like to generate and deploy a new char a car file than to actually go in and just edit. Unless you can deploy multiple car files like in layers. But, they, but say say you say oh crap we screwed up in production and we need to change this one property like right now because we're losing hundred thousand right. dollars a minute right. It's it's yeah. going to be a little more difficult. A car tool. Not only that, that, the production team or the ops team is not going to tell the developers like they're not going to say hey we changed this. Just, that communication is going to be lost and all of a sudden now there's a differential between what's happening on production and what's but, happening. But if you on. can if you can make a, a car that just applies that one patch on top of what you, all of what you already have then you can track that patch because it's in an actual deployed file on its own. You haven't edited the car that you would read on earlier. Yeah, so I was thinking that you, my own vision of the way the process would work is that you, you would have a car and then if you did need to change the configuration, you wouldn't overlay another car on top of it, but you would take that car and uh, essentially undeploy it or redeploy it with the changes. But does that just sort of take the exact problem we have now? And make like a new layer of complexity and no because this 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 is something that they don't mind changing this is configuration separate from the application so you might have a different configuration for different applications and different deployments and this is exactly the one this is the change that you really want to apply to this operating environment and there's nothing no value in the old one yeah it helps isolate it for sure Yeah. The app would have to know. You'd have to notify the app. So, so management is another thing I'd given a thought a thought to, and I think um, I think you probably wouldn't get to that certainly in the first round, um, given that people already have uh, deployment tools to kind of modify things and MBeans to modify things right now through management tools that they have. You probably wouldn't add some specific way of doing that. In fact, I think management is itself probably a bigger problem than just this. <laughs> you, you know, I think a management API was tried and, and wasn't that successful already. Um, probably not a rat hole I would want to fall into. 
Yeah, I'll probably wrap it up. Well, okay, well thank you very much for your input. Really, really, really valuable. Um, my email address is michael.keith at oracle.com, so um, please send me an email if anything else comes to you. I'm gonna record copiously everything that you've said. Okay, thanks.